Hello and welcome back to Planet Sail and episode four of On Course, our regular look at the sailing world. Now here in the UK, we've had the sunniest springtime and early summer on record, but we haven't really been able to do anything with it until now. With lockdown being eased, we're back. We're back by the water and it's great to be down here. So in this episode, I talk exclusively to the man who won the America's Cup twice as I visit Ernesto Bertarelli at his home on the shores of Lake Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, so we're, we're pleased to where we got uh, with Alinghi and uh, the story is not over. We have more crash and burn from the sailors in Lou. And we introduce a new section, Dock Talk, into the mix. But first, with strict rules on social distancing still in force, it's quite tricky getting back on the water. Unless you go short-handed sailing, that is. So that's what I did and got to sail a boat that I've been meaning to test for some time. It's weird, isn't it? As the lockdown gets eased around the world, you still can't get a haircut. I never thought I'd hear myself say that. Anyway, the good news is we can now go sailing. So long as, that is, it's with a member of your household or the person that you're sailing with doesn't get closer than two metres. All of which led me to think the answer's obvious, isn't it? short-handed or solo sailing. So I came down to Hamble to find out about both. And I also came down to find out about a boat that's been the talk of the town in the short-handed world. So the boat I've come to see is the Junot Sunfast 3300. It's one of the latest in a new breed of boats designed specifically for short-handed sailing. Now I'm with Nigel Colley here, who is actually the UK agent for Junot Yachts. He's also a very experienced uh, amateur solo sailor. And Nigel, first of all, tell us a bit about this boat. Just give us an overall view about what this boat's all about. Well, this boat has been designed in collaboration between Daniel Andrio, famous French designer, and Guillaume Verdier, who's more known for his AC America's Cup stuff and uh, the Mocha 60s. So they've got together, Guillaume, Guillaume Verdier's drawn the lines of the boat, and Danielle has IRC optimised it. So it's very much a collaboration, but it's been designed specifically with shorthanded racing in mind. And it's sort of in, in, in a line of boats from Sunfast that have sort of been quite successful in this, in this area, isn't it? Yeah, well, I suppose it all kicked off with the Sunfast 3200, which came out in 2004, 2005. And that was designed as a one-off project for the Transquadra race. But it did exceptionally well, and it took off, and Geno put it into production. Ten years later, it was still in production. Then they bought out the Sunfast 3600. And last year, they bought out the Sunfast 3300, which is more designed for people wanting to do transoceanic shorthanded racing. It's a very different looking boat though, isn't it? It's, I mean, yeah. the first thing that strikes you about this boat, it's so full, in, yeah. or tubby basically in, in the bow, isn't it? Well, it is tubby, but it is actually narrower. It's a foot longer than the Sunfast 3200. It's a foot narrower, but it's got a lot more volume at the front end, which I'm sure you'll see later. And it's got a very unique rocker profile. It's concave at the bow and concave at the stern. But when you put a concave rocker profile in there, it creates a low pressure point on the hull so you need to even that out by having the concave at the back as well but it, it does create more lift so the bo boat pops up onto the plane earlier and if you can get up on the plane four or five knots before the next boat you're doing four or five knots more boat speed and this is all sort of development that's coming from the big boats as well isn't it it's coming i guess from the yeah. mocha 60s the yeah. class 40s those hotbeds of yeah. development well, all the latest offshore boats, it started with the minis, with the scow bows, and that's been taken on by the class 40s, and as far as they're allowed to push their rule, and now the Amoka 60s, everybody's coming out with the scow bows. Mm. Now this has become a very competitive market, isn't it, around sort of 30-something foot for short-handed sailing. Yep. What's, what's driving that? It's been a steady increase, hasn't it, over, over the last few years? It's just so much fun. It, it's, it's the F factor, it's the fun factor. Um, my typical customers are so varied. They're big boat owners coming down. You know, they haven't got the time resource or the, the energy to organize a crew of 12 to 15 people on their 40 foot plus boats. 
They've done that and now they just want to go sailing for themselves. The shorthanded scene in general has quietly been growing year on year in the last few years. And now with the 2024 Paris Olympics, with the new mixed gender double-handed killboat class, it's really taken off. Mm, sounds really interesting. Right, well, I guess we should go out there and go and play with it. Yeah, I'll show you how to do it. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, so we're on our way out into Solon. It's an absolutely perfect day. It looks like 15 knots, bright sunshine, the rest of it. But of course, we have to still remember the social distancing. So, uh, Nigel, that's no man hugs or, or high fives or anything like that. No, 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 none of that. <laughs> and of course, what we have brought out with us to uh, make sure that we uh, keep within the rules is uh, some elements to uh, make sure that we stay nice and clean and sanitized so we've got all our wipes and the rest of it so that's the safety bit Here we are out in what, about 15 knots of breeze sailing across the Solum. It's been absolutely perfect conditions. Tides are uh, going to the east against the breeze, so we've got a little bit of a sea state that's kicked up now, which is interesting because it means that it's quite a sort of punchy beat now because uh, that distinctive short Solent chop that is such a boat stopper. And I say interesting because this boat has got such full bows and such a full form up forward, you'd think it would really struggle in these conditions. That's what sort of common sense would tell you. But the reality is, is that these boats, strange though they may look, are actually very good upwind. You've just got to sail them with a fair bit of heel. And uh, we've been sailing up here at about uh, 18 degrees heel, seems to be what she likes at the moment. But it's a quick little boat. Upwind, we've been doing steady at 6.9 to 7.1 knots upwind at an apparent wind angle of 32 degrees. That's not too shabby in anybody's language. But the thing that's really noticeable about this boat, you can't get away from, is how well set up the cockpit is. All of the key controls are led back to places where you can get them. There's basically two zones in this cockpit. There's the companionway, just here, around there, the pit where all the, uh, where the halyards, reefing systems, that kind of stuff goes on, just as you'd normally expect. And then back here, further back here in the cockpit, we've got all the key controls from main sheet, course, fine tune, Traveller, uh, we've got uh, the running backstays with their fine tune adjustment as well. One of the things that's interesting on this boat is it's got a set of double spreaders but they're heavily swept aft so there's a lot of security in the rig which means that the runners are really a trimming aid upwind. You can, uh, you can sail quite happily without the runners on which is a big relief to uh, those who are sailing short-handed that if the runners aren't on it's not the end of the world clearly clearly they perform a rather different task when you're going downhill with a big kite set the other thing that strikes me about this boat is how deep the cockpit is which is not something you normally come across on race boats we're used to them being shallow dishes but this has got the position of the side decks and the cockpit sole means it's really quite deep and you feel quite secure in the cockpit. Also, it means that when you're winding winches and getting your back into something, you're not bending down to get to the winch, which has been a criticism of some of the other boats in this category.
people that are moving over to shorthand and sailing, what's inspired them? Has it been the Grand Prix rock star, the Mocha 60s, last 40s, or have they come from a different place? Well, I think initially, they're watching all the Grand Prix rock stars, but then in recent years, all the rock people have seen the double-handed boats cleaning up in every class. Now, the double-handed boats are consistently beating on handicap the fully crewed boats. What do you, is there anything that you could put your finger on that has allowed that to happen? I mean, why now is the obvious question. I, I think because with, with the growth of double-handed in general, the main major manufacturers, you know, Genot, Dela, Beneteau, have clocked on to that and they're designing boats like this, which make double-handed sailing even easier and more manageable. So the, it's not a scary race boat that needs a full crew. It's designed to be sailed by me, people like me. Middle-aged, portly, I can do it, you can do it. And I guess some of that knowledge and the, te the technology from the boat builder's point of view has actually come from the Grand Prix end. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're taking what they learned in the Figaro's and all the solo sailors and, and they brought that down to the package which works on a boat like this. But the French lead the way by far, they know what works. They know the layouts, they know the systems, they know the boat geometries. They've, they've, they really are the masters. Well, what's she like to sail? Well, I'll tell you one thing you spot right from the very start, and that's that this is a boat that is indeed made for short-handed sailing. You just can't miss it. The cockpit is so well laid out. Even from the helming position, even if you didn't have the autopilot on, you can move forward, you can get to the primary winches, you can get to the secondary winches, the halyards and everything else pretty easily, and blow stuff without ever having to turn the autopilot on if you had to. It's a quick boat as well. Upwind, we've had about 14 knots true today, and we've been steadily sailing at between 6.9 and 7.1 knots at about 32, 33 degrees to the, the uh, apparent wind angle. The only slight disappointment has been to discover that the autopilot is actually better at doing it than, uh, well, at least I am anyway. So that's a bit of a disappointment for the day. Um, downwind, if you heat it up in that kind of breeze, we were getting about 10 knots, occasionally hitting 11 knots. It's a quick little boat and it's great fun to sail and it feels very, very secure. And I can see why it's been such a big hit, particularly with short-handed sailors, because you get on it and it inspires confidence straight away because you can reach everything, got main sheet close to hand, runners, jib sheets, in out uh, haulers on the barber hauler, on the Genoas, on the Genoa sheets rather, autopilots close to hand and of course the real key thing particularly with this modern generation of short-handed boats or indeed it's crossing over into cruising boats now is twin rudders and the secure sure-footed feel that that gives and that's completely unmistakable and of course in the past that would come with a rather sort of heavy feel to the helm but this is a helm that you can sail as you would normally expect to sail a boat light on the helm light to the touch quick to the response. It's a great little boat to sail. I can really see why it's been so successful already. So the boat's good, that's pretty clear. But what about short-handed sailing? Is it really going to carry on increasing in popularity? I'd say so. I don't think there's much doubt about that at all. As people discover the pleasure of sailing double-handed offshore, where there's never a moment to get bored, there's always so much going on and the strong sense of satisfaction when you've got round the course. There's no question in my mind that short-handed sailing is here to stay, particularly with boats like this one that make it so much easier to do it. I've also discovered something else. The haircut can wait. So if that's whetted your appetite for a bit of short-handed sailing, make sure you check out our next episode when we go back out on the water and Nigel shows us some of his tips and tricks for short-handed and solo sailing.
Be it racing or cruising, the multi-hull world has been growing considerably for some time. Driven by some big leaps in performance, multi-hulls have actually got a lot easier to handle as well. But the technology that's allowed it isn't always that easy to see. The Hudson Yacht Group have been among those leading the charge in this field with their range of performance cats. The latest version of the H866 is a properly cool cat. Designed by Morelli and Melvin, it has fly-by-wire systems throughout, which offers some interesting benefits. For a start, it saved on construction time. Fly-by-wire also saved a huge amount of weight and contributed to the latest boat, number six, being 1,500 kilos lighter than her sister ships. It also allowed different control profiles to be set for crew and guests. Another innovation is the use of tinting glass that is controlled electronically to keep the accommodation cool. This is a really interesting new cat from a team with a very impressive track record. Now, while lockdown has started to be eased, it hasn't necessarily answered the problem of how you go sailing with a full crew and keep them all socially distanced. Well, some say you don't. Instead, you go shorthanded sailing and you get used to using your autopilot. So with that in mind, instrument manufacturers Brooks and Gatehouse went and asked some of the experts in the solo and shorthanded field about how they deal with their autopilots and how they get the best out of them. They've put together a mini-series, they've put it on their website, and it's really well worth a read. And to find out more, click on the link above. In 2003, the America's Cup saw the start of a revolution as Ernesto Bertarelli's Swiss-flagged campaign took the trophy from New Zealand on its first attempt. It was a massive blow for the Kiwis. But this cup cycle had seen changes in other areas too. From the start, Alinghi had opened its doors to the public at a time when most teams had high walls and security cameras. But the biggest change was that, for the first time in its history, the trophy was heading back to Europe and would not be competed for in the home waters of the holder. Instead, the event would be based in Valencia, and it turned out to be a huge success. The 32nd America's Cup in 2007 was an event like no other, a carnival where the public was actively encouraged to get involved. And from this perspective, it was a huge success for the city as well as for Alinghi, who defeated their old rivals Team New Zealand once again. But the next cycle couldn't have been more different, as arguments and legal battles marked a bitter period that ended up with just one challenging team, BMW Oracle Racing, taking on the defenders, Alinghi. Technically a deed of gift match, it was quickly nicknamed the Dog Match, and was raced in two giant multi-hulls, the Alinghi Cat and BMW Oracle Racing's Trimaran. In the best of three race series, Alinghi lost 2-0 and since then has never been back in the cup. I met up with Ernesto Bertarelli at his home on the shores of Lake Geneva and I started our conversation by asking him whether, given his close association with the America's Cup and his enthusiasm for multi-hulls, whether it had been difficult walking away from sailing's most prestigious trophy. Um, it, it was hard to get away because um, it's, it's a sport I love and uh, I really love the cup. I, I, still, uh, I still love the cup and I, be, I, I believe the cup is um, the pinnacle of our sport and it's this particular event which needs to drive our sports forward. Um, so it was, it was tough to leave it at a time really when I thought we had done some great things with it. Valencia 2007 I thought had um, brought sailing to a, a, a very very good strong place. Um, it was uh, also um, difficult to l see it go to multi-hall which is obviously a support which uh, 
I really love. I really like sailing multi oil. Now, the distinction between a multi oil and a foiler, I mean, I, I would say boats who have limited drags and are light, light, light boats. Uh, to see it going um, towards that um, sort of sailing was um, tough to see happen and not participate. Uh, having said that, uh, I won twice the cup and uh, by the end of the third campaign I was a little tired uh, of the politics and uh, some of the, um, you know, the, the, some of the work that needed to be done in order to participate. It was just a little, and, and frankly some of the characters I had enough of. And uh, so that, in that sense it was great to stop, uh, give it a break go back to sailing for fun, pure fun, just to enjoy sailing, um, take care of uh, other things, uh, my family, my, my business also. So I have really don't have any regrets and um, uh, I really uh, think that now Aling is in a, in a good place. Uh, also because that transition allowed me to look after some uh, of the younger sailors uh, here in Switzerland, uh, build a team around them and now we have a very strong team, I believe. Uh, so we're, we're pleased uh, uh, to where we got uh, with Alinghi and uh, the story is not over. You were at, um, well you just said you were in Bermuda, you went over to go and see it, didn't you? And I heard a rumour that um, when you heard that it was going to be in Monohulls that you said, okay, well I wouldn't be interested. One. Were, were you interested? I mean, when you'd seen what was going on in Bermuda, did you start to think, oh, I could be tempted back? Yeah, I, I was tempted. Uh, more, more, really, more frankly, uh, people tempted me. There's, a, there's quite a few people that um, want to see Alinghi back in the cup. Um, that includes sponsors. Um, we are a competitive team. We've proven to be competitive. We know the game. Um, and with the multi hole and with a boat that I had somewhat settled, uh, I felt that uh, that would be an opportunity to um, get back into the cup without reinventing the wheel and with, with, with an opportunity to win based on skills rather than on funds and on um, engineering um, innovative uh, breakthrough. Uh, I think the danger with uh, every time you introduce a new class and I think that's the problem we've had since Valencia is that we introduced almost every cycle a new class of boat is that innovative breakthrough uh, are a lot more important than sailing skills than teamwork and uh, and and R&D and I know something about R&D this is uh, in healthcare, in pharma, my business, R&D requires funds, requires money, so it becomes a little bit more a, a money game. You still have, you need people, but you need more engineers than sailors, and it tilts the balance a little bit too much in-house than on the water. Um, and even though it's uh, fascinating uh, to see these boats uh, being created and hearing and uh, seeing some of the mock-ups, understanding what's going on, it's fascinating, but you realize that most of the work is happening indoor, that a lot of the resources are put behind engineers, and I, I felt that yet another class of boat, yet another breakthrough type of challenge was not exactly what I was looking for. I really enjoy going sailing. I think ultimately the magic in the cup and in match race is when boats are close. I felt in Bermuda, even though some people did not quite realize um, the boats were very close, the differential in speed, um, it's a little bit like in Formula One, DRS. Any puff creates a DRS moment. Uh, so the boats were close, they had that kind of edge from a little change in wind that was going to open a great uh, deal of tactical opportunity for match racing and I really thought that it would have been fantastic to stay with that that class um, and that that attracted me a lot because the 
that's what makes the magic of the cup is that those few moments in history where two teams are very well matched up and then the mental game the team which is able to deal best with the pressure uh, wins i think i hope that i hope that this is going to happen in new zealand but uh, in my mind there's a question mark given the width of um, design uh, space there is uh, the unknown of um, what's going to make this boat go fast and and we might not have uh, that magic and you know the the america's cup is a f um, significant investment not only financial but also mental and uh, physical and so you know not being certain to be able to find that uh, kind of um, made me pull out. And I wonder whether your experiences in the 33rd Cup, you know, the dog, the dog match between the cat and the try, where that was a big um, technology race for such a long time, did that, I mean, that must have taken a lot out of you. I mean, you said that earlier on, you were saying that you didn't feel it afterwards, but I wonder if that, if that made, did that make you more wary of getting involved in another technological race or experience in the 33rd? Um, the dog match uh, was a very interesting experience uh, no regret there, I learned a lot. Any uh, cup cycle you want to understand how the rules are going to be set and the rules are never set up front um, you have this dance between the challenger and the defender and that's a big part of making a decision um, to participate or not and I think people who win the cup um, don't quite or at least I haven't seen them pay enough attention to that particular aspect um, which is related to changing the class, right? If you, if you keep the same, if you keep enough certainty, you're going to have more teams. If you keep the uncertainty uh, higher, uh, you're going to have less player. It's a little bit like, um, you know, what are the odds when you walk into a casino, right? If the odds are um, too skewed on the side of the house, you're not going to go in bed. When the wing sail came in, uh, I just said, uh, this is getting out of, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, just uh, getting crazy. I'm going to have to spend another 30 million for a wing sail. Um, and it might not stop there because it seems that the rule might change again, yet again. Um, so we stayed with the, with the, with the, the mast, uh, knowing that the wing was going to be uh, a, big, uh, a big element. Um, it's a dog match. Would you be, now you've seen, and that now we know so much more about the next boat, the AC-75 and the foil in Monohull, would you be tempted into that now? I need to see what's uh, gonna happen in, in uh, New Zealand. Uh, and then you need to see what's gonna happen once one boat crosses the line, who's in charge, um, what they who they, who they who they choose as a as a challenger I, I like I like stability because I think ultimately as I was saying you know the magic in the America's Cup is the matchup and for a matchup you need to try to find a ways to bring the teams together uh, in Valencia that I think made the magic of the event is that to some extent all the teams over time because the class of boat was very uh, was had been around for a while all the boats had their moments um, today um, with the current class of boat unless you have a massive budget you have no chance I saw a great matchup in Bermuda I saw really really exciting racing in Bermuda um, I saw I saw match race and I was very very pleased with that the America's Cup, as you've alluded to earlier on, there's a lot of pressure on you, there's a lot of political stuff, there's a lot of characters who turn out to be rather different people when they're under pressure, and, and you've been involved in all kinds of fights, let's say not fights, but yeah, you know I mean? arguments. Arguments, yeah. 
Do you, and yet there you were in Bermuda, surrounded by some people who you've had some yeah. very good relationships with and some very big bust yeah. ups with. How is it now? Do you feel, is that sort of, are you all friends again now? Or what's the mood I, like now? I, I, I tell you what's the mood, you know, as we haven't seen each other for a while and, and you said, uh, how nice to see you, you haven't changed. And I told you, well, actually I said, I hope I've changed. Uh, I think um, as you mature and you see more things and you learn more about yourself, um, you are able to take a bit more distance from that and you see that most of it is unnecessary. I mean, you can't quite change people, but you can certainly change yourself and, and so um, I have, um, I wouldn't say distance because it's not most distant, but maybe a, 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 a more um, uh, aware and, and awakened to this sort of unnecessary friction, which happens. Um, I, I think I've grown to le be less affected by it. So talking of experiences, I mean, you've been right at the very top of the sport. You've won the most prestigious trophy in sport twice. You're a very, very active sailor. What, what's, what's your goal? What you know, for me, I still enjoy the perfection of a team working at its best. Um, and I guess that's why I go back. You mentioned um, your sister's boat. You've not been tempted to go around the world and or won't she let you on it? I, you see me dressed up, we're in the month of June. I get cold very easily. Um, uh, she has uh, that gene uh, I don't have. Um, so uh, I struggle very quickly with humidity and cold and uh, just, yeah, I'm happy to come back home every night. <laughs> As anyone who has got close to it will confirm, the America's Cup can become highly addictive. So would he be back? Well, our interview was filmed last season, and he didn't rule it out then. Judging by the response we had after we ran the feature on the splash and burn activities at Lou Sailing Club in Cornwall, we thought we'd better run some more. Particularly if you wanted to know how many ways there are to capsize an Enterprise and a National Red Wing.
So once again, and as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you also for all the comments that keep coming in. Just keep sending them, we love reading them. Also, make sure that you subscribe, check us out on Facebook as well. And in the meantime, I do hope you get out on the water, stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.